Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for being here. Um, I think we've learned quite a bit over the course of the last couple of years. I think it would be an understatement to say that we were all caught flat-footed in 2016. Um, so social media platforms, the intelligence community, this committee, government as a whole. Um, obviously, we want to learn from that. And what I'd like to start with is to ask from each of you, since 2016, your platforms have uh, been used throughout the course of a number of subsequent elections, uh, elections in France, in Germany, uh, in other Western allies, uh, across Europe. What, uh, what have you learned from those consequential elections after 2016, and how has that informed your current posture in terms of uh, how you're gaining transparency into this activity? Ahead, Senator, Senator, I think we've learned a lot, and I think we're going to have to continue to learn because as we learn, our opponents learn, and we have to keep up. We're working on technology and investments in people, making sure fake news is disseminated less on the platforms, transparency actions and taking down bad actors. And we've seen everywhere from Mexico to Brazil to um, other places around the world, these same techniques deployed differently. And each time we see it, I think we get smarter, I think we see the new threat, and I think we're able to connect the dots and prevent those threats going forward. We've, we've also learned a lot from uh, elections around the world, and uh, most recently the, the Mexican election. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, opened a new portal uh, to cover that election that allows any journalist or government law uh, enforcement to actually um, report any suspicious behavior very quickly to us so we can take more actions. Otherwise, we have been investing in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning models to again recognize the patterns of behavior uh, because we believe this is where the greatest leverage will come from, recognizing how people artificially amplify information and shutting it down before it spreads. Um, into the shared spaces of Twitter and more broadly into someone's replies to a tweet. So I want to get to um, the basic issue of um, whether our incentives in this case are aligned to deal with these challenges. Um, if, if your users were to lose confidence, uh, confidence in your platforms, um, in the authenticity of, of what you, Mr. Dorsey, called uh, a public square, I might call it a digital public square. Um, I assume there would be very serious economic implications for your companies. Do you think the, the incentives have aligned for platform providers of, of all types in the digital space uh, to want to get at these issues and have a plan and be able to respond in real time? Ms. Sandberg, and then you, Mr. Dorsey. Absolutely. Trust is the cornerstone of our business. People have to trust that what they see on Facebook is authentic. People have to trust that this is a positive force for democracy and the things they care about. And so this has been uh, a huge issue for us, and that's why we're here today, and that's why we're going to keep working to get ahead of these threats and make sure we can minimize all of this activity. Our incentives are aligned, but I, I do believe it goes a lot deeper um, than just the alignment of our company incentives with this committee and the American people, I believe we need to question the fundamental incentives that are in our product today. Every time someone opens up our service, every time someone opens up our app, we are implicitly incentivizing them to do something or not to do something. And that extends all the way to our business. And those answers that we get from asking that question are going to create massive shifts in how Twitter operates, and I also believe how our industry operates. So what worked 12 years ago does not work today. It hasn't evolved fast enough, but I think it's a, a layer, many, 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 many layers deeper than the surface symptoms that we often find ourselves discussing. Ms. Sandberg, you, uh, you mentioned a number of things that uh, if that would violate your standards, for example, hate speech, uh, advocacy of violence. What about when we're dealing with real people, authentic users, intentionally spreading false information? And obviously there are huge um, free speech implications there. But for example, what if a real person, a, a US citizen, 
says um, that victims of a mass shootings were actually actors, for example. Um, would that violate your standards? And if the answer is no, how should we, and I be, my we, I mean government and industry, deal with those very real challenges? Well, let me start by saying I find claims like that personally unbelievably upsetting. If you've been a victim or a parent of a victim, they deserve all, our full support. And finding the line between what is hate speech and what is minister information is very, very difficult, especially if you're dedicated to expressing free expression. And sometimes free expression is expressing things you strongly disagree with. In the case of min misinformation, what we do is we refer it to third party fact checkers. We don't think we should be the arbiter of what's true and what's false, and we think that's really important. Third party fact checkers then mark it as false. If it's marked as false, we dramatically decrease the distribution on our site. We warn you if you're about to share it. We warn you if you have shared it. And importantly, we show related articles next to that so people can see alternative facts. The fundamental view is that bad speech can often be countered by good speech. And if someone says something's not true and they say it incorrectly, someone else has the opportunity to say, actually, you're wrong, this is true. And that's what we're working on through our systems. I think one of the things we found in 2016 is that um, we didn't have the transparency and the literacy to do what you just pointed out there, to counter false speech with, with accurate speech, to understand how the speech was propagating in the digital public space. Um, what more do you think we should be doing to simply make the public more literate about the fact that this information warfare is very real. It's going on all the time. It's not fake news. It's not a hoax. It's something we're all going to have to deal with that our kids, even playing platforms like Pokemon Go, may have to, uh, have to deal with as well. Do either of you have a quick uh, opinion on that? And then my time will be expired. I apologize, Mr. Chair. I, I believe we need to point to um, where we see healthy participation and clearly mark what is healthy and what is unhealthy. And also realize that not everyone is going to choose healthy participation in the short term, but how do we encourage healthy participation in order to increase their reach and also increase the value of what they're giving to that digital public square? 